411 was out on Ahab. Everybody knew he was a punk. He was a spoiled brat. He, he, he had no spine. He was a pushover. His wife ran everything. He was quick to pout if things didn't go his way. And, and, and so Benadad is thinking, you know, maybe I can, I can take advantage of that. So even in the position of weakness, even in defeat, he meets with King Ahab and he, he tries to punk him, plain and simple. He actually sits down with him and dictates to him the terms of a peace treaty. And like normally the victor makes the rules, but he in a conquered state is like, yo, check this out, player. How about you let us live? You let us keep our government, our infrastructure in place. Uh, let us keep our money, all of our resources. We don't have to pay any taxes, no tribute. All of our people get to live free, live and let live. And, and then we'll, we'll let your vendors come to our marketplace downtown, set up shop in, in Damascus. We'll throw in a couple of polo t-shirts and a bag of Skittles. We call it Even Steven. Deal? And, and, and I can see Ahab sitting like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> and, and Badass says, okay, okay. All the cities of Israel that my father snatched up from your father, I'll give them back to you. And it might take a while. You know how it is. Got to relocate everyone. Got to get the zoning commissioner down here. He's a busy man. There's, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of backlog, a lot of red tape to get through. But at some point, we'll get it all squared away. Okay? And Ahab says, your word is good enough for me, my brother. And a prophet comes to him and rebukes him. Like, what, y'all BFFs now? That's your brother? You, you were supposed to take him out. Like, this was a man marked for death. He had chance after chance to see the power of Yahweh, didn't capitulate, he's constantly harassing God's people. It was time for him to go. So now you a dead man. It's going to be your life for his life and your people for his, his people. So now 1 Kings 22, three years have passed, but Benedict to this point has not fulfilled his end of the bargain in giving back the cities that he promised in the armistice. Now maybe he's given some of them, but he's not giving them all back. And I like to think that at some point during those three years, Ahab tried to get the cities back, and, and probably in his own way. So he probably went to Benadad and said something like, yo, man, Jezebel's chipping, man. She want me to ask for my city back. You know I wouldn't trip. And Benadad is like, what city? Ramoth Gilead, the one your pops took from mine, the one I've been asking you about. Oh, that city. Ain't no you want it back, homie. It's right over here. But I got a confession to make. You're not going to like it. That's my city, punk. Come get it. You want some of this? Ahab's like, no. So he goes running back to his officials with his tail between his legs. He's moping. He's pouting as is his wont. And he's like, I asked Benadad about turning over Ramoth Gilead back to us. And he won't do it. I was very reasonable, but I get no respect from him. That's my city, my high city. I want it back. What are we going to do? And the fish was like, yo, bro, you the king, man. What you asking us for? So at this time, Joseph, the king of Judah, comes, comes by because his son has just married Ahab's daughter, which is asinine of itself because Joseph is actually one of the few good kings of Judah. But Joseph had come through, and Ahab sees opportunity. And so, so, so he tells him, Jehoshaphat, my guy, I'm scared of Benadad. I'm scared spitless. He's a big man with a big army. He's in my head. But I, I need my city back. I, and I hear good things about you. I hear the Lord's blessing you. Everybody's intimidated by you. We even got the Philistines and the Arabs paying you tribute. I need you. My guy, I need you on my squad. Please help me, please. And Job is like, calm down, bro. I, I got your back, man. Here's a Kleenex. Now, of course, he had no business allying himself with this evil king Ahab. But he does have the wherewithal to say, yo, before we do anything, we need to ask the Most High, get his blessing. Now, understand that at this point, Ahab needs no convincing. He has Jehoshaphat on his team. He, he really wants his city back. He's determined to go, come what may. But because he knows Jehoshaphat's a godly man, and he needs Jehoshaphat more than Jehoshaphat needs him, he appeases him and trots out these 400 so-called prophets of Jehovah. And they all give him the green light. Go up, Yahweh will give you the victory over Syria. So these are fake prophets. These so-called prophets of God promise success, but Jehoshaphat's not buying it. He smells a rat. He's like, I, I heard about your, your, your wicked kings of Israel. Y'all ordain anybody who wants to be a prophet, you say, come on in. 
Anybody wants to be a priest, you don't look at their resume, you don't look at their lineage, you don't look at their track record. You just stamp approval and let them do their thing. I need someone who's legit. I need someone with a beard, with a gruff voice, hasn't taken a bath for a while, has got a haggard appearance because he's been in jail for, for rustling some feathers and ticking people off. Seems like you, all you got is yes men. And Ahab says, maybe not. I know a guy. But I can't stand him. He, he always has something smart to say about me, always prophesying doom and gloom. And Joseph is like, hold up. <laughs> Let me get this straight. You have somebody who's a prophet of God who doesn't like you, wicked King Ahab, and you don't like him. Oh, oh, this is going to be good. Where's my popcorn? Man, this is, the, this is the man we need to talk to. Bring him in. So his messenger goes to Micaiah, who's a prophet, who scholars believe is the same prophet who prophesied against Ahab about Benadad, lecturing him for letting him off the hook in chapter 20. So Ahab doesn't want to hear his mouth because now things have gotten out of hand with Benadad, and he doesn't want an I told you so speech. But he knows he has to placate Jehoshaphat, so he sends a messenger to go get Micaiah the prophet. And the messenger tells him, yo, everyone's on the same page, predicting success for the king. So don't make waves. Just, just play ball. Just play cool. So, so Micaiah comes in, and Ahab asks him, shouldn't I go up to Ramoth Gilead? And Micaiah chose him. You know, he's thinking, you've already made up your mind. You don't really want to know God's will. You just want your opinion to come out of my mouth. So ain't no point in asking me. So he tells him, go up. Yahweh will give you the victory. That's what you want to hear, right? And, and Ahab just hears the sarcasm and the shade just dripping from his mouth. And, and he, he knows Jehoshaphat's watching and is going to get upset and see through this. So before he can object, he says, Micaiah, stop playing games. I want the truth. And Micaiah says, you can't handle the truth. Because real talk, y'all going to lose. Bottom line. How about them apples? And Ahab told us, turns to Joseph and says, I told you. See, he's always got something smart to say. He doesn't like me. Always trying to rain on my parade. And Micaiah continues. And this is where it gets interesting. So he relays this vision that he has where he saw God sitting on his throne and the whole multitude of heaven is standing around him. And God says, who will entice Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So you have different ideas being thrown around. This is a brainstorming session going on. And then one spirit comes forward and says, I will persuade him by being a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And, and, and God says, you know, I think you're onto something. Go ahead and do what you do. Now, the question is, who is this lying spirit? Because, you know, we know from the Bible that God cannot tempt anyone. That James says that. We know from numerous verses in the Bible, God cannot lie. He is truth personified. So this cannot be God. It cannot be any of his agents. This is none other than Satan, the father of lies himself, or somebody under his command. But most likely it's Satan because we see in the book of Job, a similar council of heaven comes together and, and, and Satan is there and, and he's given permission by God to go do what he wants to do. So here God has allowed Satan to do evil, but he's also sent truth. And even though Ahab, by this point, he's sold, he's sold out to the devil, he's consumed with wickedness, there's really no hope for him. God in his mercy still gives him an opportunity for salvation. And the Micaiah is telling him, all these prophets have a lying spirit. They're leading you to your death. Don't listen to them. So Ahab gets mad, throws Micaiah in prison, goes out into battle, and gets killed just like was prophesied. Now, we can blame God for what happened. You know, the text even says that the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of these prophets. But clearly we know that it was Satan's lies. And yet it's still, we can't blame him either. Because Ahab already made a choice to do evil this whole time. Like, he was already dead set on going to get his precious little city back. He didn't need the devil. 